Welcome to Tax Law GH and welcome to our video on the continuation of the basic income tax principles or the basic income tax concepts. I want to mention at this point that if you haven't watched the first part of this video, please take a look at that as a number of concepts we discuss there will serve as foundation or will serve as your strong footing to understand these concepts better. The first concept we'll look at here is the concept of tax residence. I'm sure you are so used to the word residence. We usually throw the word around and say he's resident in Ghana, she's resident in Canada. He is resident in the US, she's resident in Japan. Tax residence is different. For example, if a Canadian citizen comes to Ghana to live in Ghana. Let's step away from tax for a second, right? So this is not tax residence, general residence, what you know in your dictionary to mean residence, right? Or what you know residence to mean according to your dictionary. If a Canadian comes to Ghana and he lives in Ghana, we can say, oh, he resides in Ghana, right? But under tax, residence is a completely different topic. And this is so crucial that you, you need to understand this. For you to understand income tax really well, the concept of tax residence is probably one of the most important, if not the most important. When we say tax residence, it is tax residence for a person. So we have the concept of a resident person. And if you watch the first video, we said a person could either mean an individual or an entity. So it means when we say tax residence, we could have a resident individual we could have a resident company, we could have a resident partnership, and we could have a resident trust. As usual, I have the reference to Act 896, the Income Tax Act on the right, if you want to read further. A resident individual, that is you and I, people like you and myself, we say someone is resident in Ghana for tax purposes if that individual is a citizen of Ghana. So the first point you need to remember is, Every citizen of Ghana is by default tax resident unless something happens. So the starting point is all Ghanaian citizens are tax residents in Ghana unless something. What is that something? Unless that citizen has a permanent home outside Ghana and that citizen lives in that permanent home for the whole year. So remember that all citizens of Ghana are automatically tax residents in Ghana unless they have a permanent home outside Ghana and then they reside in that home. They live in that home for the whole year. That is when they will no longer be tax residents. The next point is this is not for citizens, but this is for anyone, any human being who enters Ghana, who is present in Ghana during the year for an aggregate period, for a combined period, for a summative period of 183 days or more in any 12-month period that commences or ends during the year. It is important to understand this very well. There are so many people who interpret this to mean within a calendar year, within a January to December period, if you have not spent 183 days, then you are not tax resident. Remember, the wording of the law is aggregate period of 183 days what it means is it actually says 183 days or more in any 12 month period that either commences during the year or ends during the year so what this means is you can straddle tax periods maybe straddle is a big word let's say someone came in came to ghana in october um, last year they spent three months here and then they left to their country. Probably they were thinking that oh, once they leave and they come back, we'll start counting from day one again. So they came back in third week of January and then they lived here for another three months. To them, they are like, well, in this new year, I lived for only three months. But what the law says is it's an aggregate period of one to three days or more. If you do the math, one is three days roughly come to six months. Yeah. So it's an aggregate period, it's a combined period. We don't care whether you left to your country and came back. We don't care whether there was a break. 
once we pick any 12 month period that either starts this year or ends in this year and we find that within that 12 month gap you spent one in three days in ghana you are tax resident here so for the guy who left canada came to ghana spent the last three months of the year and quickly left before the year ended and then he waited when the new year started he came to ghana in the third week spent another three months here and said well to me i've only done three months in this year no in the past 12 months you've spent a combined and aggregated period of more than 23 days and as such you have triggered tax residence so even though you are not a citizen you'll be taxed just like a tax resident person in ghana the effect of tax residence is once you are triggered as resident you are taxed just like a person who is a citizen ordinarily taxable as a tax resident in ghana so what it means is for a jamaican person who comes to ghana and spends an aggregate period of more than 183 days in ghana technically they'll be taxed just like you and i who have been living in ghana for a greater part of our lives who are taxed as tax resident individuals take note it's an aggregate period of 183 days or more in any 12 month period that either starts in the year or ends in the year the next category of persons or individuals that are deemed as tax resident will be employees or officials of the government of ghana who are posted abroad during the year so if you're an employee of the government of ghana or an official of the government of ghana and you are posted abroad for official duties or an official assignment during the year no matter where you are will deem you as tax resident in ghana take note of this is very important the final one is let's come to citizens again if you were a citizen remember we said citizens are kind of automatically tax residents unless something happens right so the final point is a citizen who is temporarily absent from ghana for a period that is not take note of the word here it's a negative for a period which is not more than 365 continuous days not aggregate where that citizen has a permanent home in ghana this might look like a long winded sentence what we are saying here is any citizen who leaves ghana on a temporary basis and doesn't spend more than one full year continuous outside ghana is still tax resident if you didn't get that let me take it again what it means effectively also is that for a citizen of ghana to break their tax residence chain they must not be in ghana for one full year that's when we deem, deem them as non-resident what does it mean for you and i if you as a citizen of ghana watching this probably leave ghana and you go to i've used jamaica i've used china you go to germany and you spend 11 months in germany from january to november and you come back for just three days and you go back you may have spent 99% of the year in Germany, but because it wasn't 365 continuous days, you broke the chain when you stepped back into Ghana. So you were, you are, you've, you've kind of like wasted your past 11 months. You have to start all over again. So for you as a citizen to break your tax residence rule or tax residence chain, you must not be in Ghana for a full year. So think about people like the footballers. They usually play outside Ghana. Right. If you're a footballer and you're going to play outside Ghana, you come for holidays in Ghana, you go back. Once you step back here, usually you've broken tax residence, right? Um, and you'll be deemed as still resident in Ghana. So take note, a citizen who is outside Ghana temporarily for not more than a full 365 um, day period will still be deemed as tax residents when they have a permanent home in Ghana. Once we treat the concept of international tax, you realize that it is possible for someone to be resident in two countries. Let me give an example. Many countries use the 183 day rule. So even the UK, I'm aware, uses the 183 day rule. So if you are in Ghana, let's say a citizen of Ghana, right? And don't forget that as a citizen, if you do not spend more than a full year outside Ghana, we still deem you resident. So let's say you are a citizen of Ghana, you spend seven months in the UK and you come back to Ghana. The UK's residence rule is you spent one is three days or more. So you're a resident. Don't forget you were there for seven months. So the UK will deem you as resident. 
For Ghana, because you didn't spend more than a full year outside Ghana, we are still calling you residents. Ghana will want to tax you on your worldwide income. UK will want to tax you on your worldwide income as well. What do we do? Then when we do international tax, there's something called a tiebreaker rule, which is a number of steps we go through to break instances where two countries are claiming residence. Right? But that is beyond the scope of the discussion at this level. So just know that it is possible for there to be a conflict of tax residents because of the rules that may overlap in certain instances. So these are the rules for what to make an individual resident in Ghana. Let's look at the rule for partnerships. Remember, it's a partnership in general is an association of um, two or more people who come together to do business. They share profits and they bear all losses, depending on their profit and loss sharing ratio. Now, a partnership is resident in Ghana. If any partner of the partnership resided in Ghana at any time during the year, so let's say you have a partnership of 15 partners, 14 of you were living in Germany, then just one guy was in Ghana running the partnership in Ghana. Because of him, the whole partnership would be deemed to be tax resident in Ghana, regardless of the fact that the majority of the partners of the partnership were outside Ghana. Take note, it's very important to remember this. For a trust, a trust is deemed to be tax resident in Ghana for a year of assessment if that trust number one is established in Ghana. So this is the first thing that will catch a trust as in the net of um, being tax resident. Once that trust is established in Ghana, we will deem them to be tax resident in Ghana. Alternatively, if a trustee of the trust resided in Ghana at any time during the year, then the whole trust is tax resident in Ghana. If you ever forget this, remember this principle is similar to the principle for partnerships, right? So for partnerships, if any partner was in Ghana at any time during the year, then the whole partnership is tax resident in Ghana. For a trust, if a trustee of the trust is resident in Ghana at any time during the year, then the trust is tax resident in Ghana. Final rule for establishing tax residency for trust is if a person who is res resident in Ghana has the power to direct or make senior managerial decisions of the trust at any time during the year, then the trust is tax resident in Ghana. And we are saying here that these decisions, we don't care how it is made. Whether he makes or the senior director in Ghana or the senior person making decisions in Ghana, whether he made this decision alone or together jointly with other persons, we don't care. Whether he made it directly or through one or more one or more interposed entities, we don't care. As long as anybody in Ghana had the power to direct senior managerial decisions at any time during the year, it could be one day, it could be two days, the whole trust is deemed to be tax resident in Ghana. So remember this as well for residence trusts. The final one we'll look at is the rules for a resident company. We deem a company to be tax resident in Ghana if that company is incorporated under the Companies Act of 2019, Act 992. I'm sure you may, have, you may be aware that this Act 992 replaced the old Companies Act in 2019. Remember this. So you may see references in some textbooks to the old Companies Act. Remember the new Act is Act 992. So either the company is incorporated under the Companies Act of Ghana or the management and control of the affairs of that company are exercised in Ghana at any time during the year. So once again, it's important to remember here that this final bullet for establishing tax residence for a company is similar to what we have for trust. Remember we said for trust where anybody has the power to make senior managerial decisions in Ghana at any time during the year, then the trust is resident for a company. If the management and control of the affairs of the company are exercised at any time during the year in Ghana, then the company is tax resident in Ghana. Now that we know who a tax resident person is, who is a non-resident person, the law has an interesting definition. It says any other person other than the above is a non-resident. So it means if you don't meet the rules for resident individual, the rules for resident partnership, the rules for resident trust and the rules for resident companies, then automatically you are a non-resident person. That does it for the concept of tax residence. Let's look at another important 
concept called accessible income. Now, if you've been following carefully, we use the term chargeable income in the previous session, part one of this series. Accessible income technically flows from accessible income. Sorry, chargeable income, I don't know if I said that. Chargeable income flows from accessible income. We derive chargeable income from accessible income. So what is accessible income? Accessible income of a person, remember person means individual or entity, right? For a year of assessment, which you also know what that means, is the income of that person from any employment, business or investment, which I'll be calling EBI from time to time. EBI is the basic level at which the Income Tax Act classifies income streams. If we are looking to tax something in Ghana, mostly we either try to place it under is it income from employment is it income from business is it income from investment which is our ebi we are saying a person's accessible income is their income from ebi for every year of assessment so we know what accessible income is we just learned who, who a resident person is so what is the accessible income of a resident person we are bringing all the concepts together gradually right so for a resident person don't forget resident person means resident individual resident company resident partnership and resident trust what is the accessible income of these persons the accessible income of a resident person for a year of assessment from any employment business or investment is the income of that person from each employment, business or investment for the year, most important point here, whether or not the source from which the income is derived has ceased. What we are saying is, once we catch you as tax residents in Ghana, once you are caught in the net of tax residents in Ghana, we don't care whether or not the source you are getting the money from has ceased. That amount is taxable in Ghana. As we progress, I've, or I'm sure I've already mentioned that there's a concept called the re worldwide system of taxation. What it means is we you do not necessarily have to bring the money into Ghana for it to be taxable in Ghana. Let's say you're a tax resident person, you have a business in Ukraine, you're making so much money there, you're a tax resident here. Going by this concept, we don't care that the money from Ukraine has not been repatriated to Ghana. It is taxable in Ghana. Obviously, and the practical question for those who may ask is, how would GRA know that you have um, you are earning income in Ukraine? Obviously, as we are progressing, as the world is developing, tax systems are getting tighter. Companies are entering into um, agreements called exchange of information agreements, where different countries agree to exchange relevant information about taxpayers, about relevant um, happenings in the country, so that relevant tax authorities can track some of these issues. Once we are progressing, advancing, there will, get to a, there will be a point where we'll be able to track in Ghana how much you are making elsewhere. The US has done a great job at this, where they have certain rules that require some countries to mandatorily report bank accounts held by certain US citizens overseas. So if the US has done it, oh, it's just a matter of time, Ghana will follow suit. But remember that the takeaway point is Accessible income of a resident person is their income from any employment, business, or investment for the whole year, whether or not the source from which the income is derived has ceased. It has nothing to do with whether they made the money in Ghana or not. No link to the source being in Ghana. Remember this. Then we know the accessible income for a resident person. How about the accessible income for a non resident person? For a non resident person, their accessible income is the income of that person from the employment business or investment for the year to the extent to which the income has a source in ghana remember this so what we say is that for non-resident persons we tax them based on something called the source principle or the sourcing rules it means if the income has a source in ghana then a non-resident person would ordinarily be taxable in ghana what this also means is that for a non-resident person in Ghana, once we deem them to be non-resident, any income they make that does not have a link to Ghana 
will not be taxable in Ghana ordinarily. Apart from the sourcing rules, we have something called a permanent establishment. Since that is not the focus here, let me give you a quick overview of what that means. Just for now, right, to have a, uh, a rough understanding of what permanent establishment means, just see it to be uh, a fixed place of business that someone has at their disposal in a country. So if a foreigner comes to Ghana and has an office in Ghana at their disposal and they carry out significant business here, just see that as a permanent establishment. Obviously, there are detailed rules under this, right? So if you if we do international tax, you realize that even the provision of services into in Ghana can also lead to the creation of what we call a PE or permanent establishment. So we call this the service PE, but that is beyond the scope of this basic discussion. Just remember that there's something called a permanent establishment is usually for foreign entities or foreign persons who create this PE in Ghana by virtue of their being in Ghana. We are saying that for a PE, it's their, the non-resident person's accessible income will be income for the year that is connected with the PE, irrespective of the source. So it means for a PE, we do not tax PEs necessarily based on the sourcing rules. Once you are a Ghanaian PE, we use something called the force of attraction rules, right? So if the PE has relevant a relevant pool on income sources from different places, then that PE's income that is attributable to Ghana, the PE in Ghana, will be taxable in Ghana. Apart from a PE, the general rule for non-residents is that the income must have a source in Ghana for it to be taxable in Ghana. What's the definition of source in Ghana? We are saying that note that the income of a person from an employment, business or investment has a source in Ghana if the income accrues in or is derived from Ghana. Accrues in means it arose from Ghana. So it typically also means the same as derived from Ghana. So either it accrues in Ghana or you derive it from Ghana, then we can say it has a source in Ghana. In summary, the source rule says that the income should have a link some way, somehow to Ghana. You made it here in Ghana, then we will tax you on that if you're not resident, right? Now that we know what accessible income is for both resident and non-resident, we need to know that there's a principle called the separate determination principle. What this says is that anyone who is determining the accessible income of a person or of another person, either themselves or someone else, it's required to determine accessible income for each class of income separately. Remember I told you we have three classes of income. It's either E, B, or I. Either employment, business, or investment. So if you are determining accessible income, you are required to determine accessible income from employment separately, accessible income from business separately, and accessible income from investment separately. This is some form of ring fencing if you want to use that term. Now that we know accessible income, let's look at chargeable income. Remember I said before we started that chargeable income is derived from accessible income. So what is chargeable income? I'm saying chargeable income of a person for a year of assessment is the total of the accessible income of the person, which we know what it means now, for the year from each employment, business, or investment. Step one. Then we'll deduct or we'll less the total amount of deductions allowed that person under the Income Tax Act. There are a number of deductions that um, persons get under the Income Tax Act in arriving at a chargeable income. So once we take out your deductions from your accessible income, then we arrive at your chargeable income. The separate determination principle also applies to chargeable income. We are required to determine chargeable income from employment separately, chargeable income from business separately, and then chargeable income from investment separately. Let's look at the principle of method of accounting. The general rule is, I'm sure you've heard of GAP or generally accepted accounting principles. That's in the timing of inclusions, which is the principle that will tell you what to add when you're determining income in Ghana and deductions, what to take out, what to deduct, what to take out of your determination. In calculating income for a person during the year, is to be done in accordance with GAP. The law defines GAP to mean International Financial Reporting Standards that the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana has adopted for Ghana. And if my memory serves me right, uh, Ghana adopted IFRS in 2007. 
So it means effective 2007, Ghana has been using IFRS or International Financial Reporting Standards as our um, accounting standard or our GAP. So the Income Tax Act effectively recognizes IFRS or recognizes GAP as the method of accounting for our taxes in Ghana or the principle that governs our accounting for taxes in Ghana. Now let's look at the specific method of accounting rules for different persons. So we are saying for an individual, when you are determining an individual's income from employment or investments, please take note we didn't mention business here. So it's an individual's employment income or the investment income. We are saying that you need to use the cash basis. Let's do accounting 101 revision. If you are using the cash base, you remember we have two main accounting bases. Is it accrual basis or cash basis? Cash basis will tell you that you recognize revenues when the physical cash is received. Recognize expenses when the physical cash is paid. Accrual says we don't care about cash. Recognize revenues when the service has been performed or the good has been delivered, basic level. Expenses are recognized when the um, corresponding liability has been um, incurred or the act that will lead to the expense has been carried out at the basic level. No transfer of cash, no receipt of cash. Right. So for an individual's income from employment or investment, we use a cash basis. Remember, it's very important. For a company, you must use the accrual basis. So companies use accrual basis, individuals use cash basis for employment or investment. By extension, what we can tease out of here is that individuals from business must use what? Accrual basis, right? Because the law is specific, employment or investment income for individuals is, is cash basis. So by, by extension, individuals from um, their business income should be on an accrual basis, just like the companies. A person other than a company it's required to account for income tax on either a cash or accrual basis, whichever most clearly reflects their income. You can see we said other than company. So it means a company is kind of stuck with accrual because it will be difficult for a company to justify to the Commissioner General of GRA that another basis other than the accrual basis will most accurately reflect their income. If we are to go into accounting, I'm sure all of you have done some basic accounting, uh, there is a standard called IAS-1 and presentation of financial statements and then the framework of financial reporting. It has rules as to um, accrual basis accounting and cash basis accounting. If you go there, you'll see that a, a company must use accrual. It will be difficult in the current climate we have, in the current world we have, for a company to do transactions on a cash basis. Right? So what we are saying is that a person other than a company is required to account on either cash or accrual, which about most clearly reflects the income. So if you can justify as an individual that an accrual basis will most clearly um, reflect your income from investments, then you can go for that. But a company is kind of stuck with an accrual basis accounting method. However, where the Commissioner General is satisfied that a particular method of accounting reflects your income, he may by written notice require you to use a particular method. So he can write to you and say, I'm instructing you to use cash basis or accrual basis, whichever. Or he can approve your application to change your method of account. So it means either he can write to you to direct you to use a particular method, or you can write to him to ask for permission to use a particular method. That's when you've sat down to analyze and realize that, well, method A over method B will most clearly reflect my income. What would be the effect of a change in your method of accounting? If you change from, let's say, accrual to cash or cash to accrual, what would be the impact on your tax compliance? We are saying that where the method of accounting of a person changes, you are required to make an adjustment in the basis period that follows the change to ensure that no item is omitted or taken into account more than once. So it means if you have a change in accounting method, you are required to do something we we'll call, if we are doing account, we would have said you do a prospective application. It should be in the subsequent periods, right? Not the preceding periods. We've come this far as usual. Let's do some concept checkers. Let's see how much you have learned. Question one. Brock Lesnar, oh, before we read a question, it's good to always um, look at the requirements so you know what the examiner wants from you. So required, we're saying is Brock right or wrong 
explain your answer. So question one says, Brock Lesnar is a citizen of Ghana. He left Ghana on 1st February 2020 and spent 190 days in China before returning to Ghana. When he got back to Ghana, the GRA issued an assessment to Brock on his income and whilst in China. Because according to the GRA, Brock was tax resident during that period. Brock claims he was non-resident during that 190-day period. Is Brock right or wrong? Explain your answer. Um, give the video a pause now and think through it. And then let me know what you think. Is Brock right or wrong? Okay, the answer is Brock is clearly wrong. Why? Remember, the question said Brock was a citizen. He left Ghana on 1st February and spent 190 days and he came back to Ghana. He's resident. Why? Let me explain. Remember we said for a citizen to break residence rules, they must have spent more than a continuous period of what? 365 days outside Ghana before they become non-resident. Brock just spent 190 days and came back. So even though he exceeded 183 days, we don't use 183 days for citizens. We use 365 days continuous. Remember this one. So Brock is wrong. Brock was still resident because he did not spend more than 365 days outside Ghana. So the GRA is right and Brock is wrong. Question two. The income of an individual from a very high paying job is required to be accounted for using which method of accounting? A. Cash basis. B. Accrual basis. C modified cash basis you can pause the video and let me know your answer in the comments if you want to ready okay the answer is a remember we said an individual's accessible income from employment and investment must be accounted for on a cash basis so the answer is a cash basis i put the word very high paying job there to see if you probably think because it's high paying probably uh, modified cash but for those who got it right, um, the trick didn't work on you. So it's cash basis. Final concept checker. Oh, two actually. Where the method of accounting of a person changes, an adjustment shall be made in the basis period dash the change. Is it the basis period before the change? Is it the basis period after the change? Is it the basis period during the change? Obviously, the answer is. You wanna guess? Pause, take a guess. After, remember I even mentioned, I think that was the last thing we did before we came here, right? So where your method changes, you are supposed to adjust in the basis period that follows the change. So it's up after, it's B, after the change, you make the change so that you don't omit anything or you don't account for anything more than once. Final question, quite long, take a read. We are saying required, is the GRA right or wrong? Explain your answer. So 13 Pro Max Ghana Company Limited is a company in Ghana with its parent company in the USA. The parent company reports using the prescribed accounting standards for the US, which is the US GAAP. 13 Pro Max Ghana, in keeping with the reporting requirements of its US parent, prepares its Ghana account using US GAAP. Due to the difference in the inventory valuation method between US GAAP and IFRS, the GRA has raised a tax audit issue in respect of 13 Pro Max Ghana. 13 Pro Max Ghana is objecting to this assessment and is denying any wrongdoing. Is the GRA right or wrong? Explain your answer. This is quite long, so you can pause here and think through it and see if what you have is what I will tell you it is. You can also type your answer in the comments section below. So yes, the GRA is right. The GRA is right for raising an issue because remember I said the gap or the general accepted accounting principles for Ghana is IFRS and not US GAAP. So if a company is using US GAAP in Ghana and because of the difference in accounting standard treatment between a certain US GAAP and our IFRS, if there's a difference, the GRA reserves every right to raise an assessment, raise an issue because the company was supposed to even use IFRS in the first place. So that brings us to the end. Very important, let's take the summary. The summary um, is very, very important. Let's see what we've learned in this session so far. We are saying a person could mean either an individual or an entity. So this is a, a session summary for the whole um, part one and part two. A person could mean either an individual or an entity. Remember this. 
the year of assessment is the same for every person. That's a calendar year, January to December. However, the basis periods for persons vary depending on the particular person. Also, we are saying at the very basic level, income tax is payable for each year of assessment by a person who has chargeable income for the year and a person who receives a final withholding payment during the year. We also learned that there are different tax residence rules for individuals, companies, partnerships, trusts. We also learned that the assessable income of a person for each year of assessment is the income of that person from any EBI. We also learned that chargeable income of a person is the total assessable income of that person less the total amount of deductions allowed that person. Then we also learned that an individual for income tax purposes for either employment income or investment income is required to account on a cash basis then a company is required to account on an accrual basis. So I hope this was helpful. If it was, hit the like button, leave a comment in the comments box below and don't forget to share this video within your network. I'll catch you in the next session.